Hello and welcome to the Methods Matter podcast from Dementia Researcher and the National Centre for Research Methods, the show for people who didn't pay enough attention during the methods lectures and for those who did but just love to consume knowledge while they're running, cooking, driving or dodging whatever they should be doing, which for me is writing up my thesis. In this series, we're looking at five different research methods with an expert from the field and a dementia researcher that has put that method into practice. And it's all delivered to coincide with the fantastic NCRM Research Methods Festival. I'm Leah Fulliger. I'm a PhD student at the University of Southampton and I research dementia care and faecal incontinence. This podcast came about when I got to the research methods section of my PhD and realised this is going to be a lot harder than I thought. So now I'm searching for answers and rapidly realising that there are many other ways, probably better ways, I could have gone about my PhD. Today we're joining the dots, layering the data, putting away the curves and going linear to discuss multi-level modelling. And helping us today are two amazing guests from opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean. In the expert corner from the University of Bristol, we have Professor Bill Brown. Bill is a professor of statistics who works across many disciplines, including education and animal welfare and behaviour. His research spans the area of statistical modelling, from the development of statistical methods to fit realistically complex statistical models to describe real life problems and the implementation of those models in statistical software. I'm going to really struggle to say the word statistical, <laughs> but most importantly, he actually wrote the book on this. Hi, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, Leah. Lovely to be here. In preparing for this discussion, I, of course, Googled you, and I was fascinated by your recent publication, Aerosol and Droplets Generation from Performing with Woodwind and Brass Instruments. That sounds like something no one would have ever considered. Did that involve an actual experiment? So, Leah, one of the joys of being a statistician is that yeah, we, get, we get to work with loads of great collaborators from different disciplines. And um, during the pandemic last year, I was approached by colleagues in our School of Chemistry, uh, and they were working with medical researchers on aerial aerosol particle movement uh, in terms of the size of the particles and the number that, they, that, that were being produced. And obviously that has a, a big impact when you think of COVID. So their research was clearly going to be useful. Uh, and initially they were looking at the differences between when, when you speak and when you sing, uh, before then thinking about, well, what about, you know, the, the, in the UK, for example, uh, people, people, Concerts were, were, were stopped and everything else. So they moved on to musical instrument playing. And they were even on our local news where they were showing an experiment where the participants repeatedly had to sing happy birthday. Uh, and in fact, it, it's really this repeating that is the, that is the, the uh, they had to repeat different activities and those were nested within each participant. And that gives their data a multi-level structure. And so they emailed me for help with their analysis. So yes, there was an experiment, but sadly, uh, due to COVID and what is often the case, being the statistician in the team, I just get to deal with the numbers that come out at the end rather than take part of the experiment. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't get to play any brass instruments. <laughs> well, I used to play the bassoon many, many years ago. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so our second guest today is our hands-on dementia researcher, hailing all the way from Penn State College of Health and Development in the US of A. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Jacqueline Mogul. Jacqueline is the co-director of the Remind Lab, which focuses on promoting health and well-being in older adults and identifying early indicators of changes in psychological and cognitive health. Jacqueline's current projects examine psychological and behaviour risk factors associated with the development of early cognitive decline. These projects are designed to uncover early intervention targets for older adults prior to precipitous declines in everyday cognitive functioning. So hello, Jacqueline. Thank you for joining the show. Your work sounds amazing. What, what attracted you to dementia? First, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to, to be here. I, I'm a big fan of the podcast, so this is um, a bucket list. Um, so I, um, I got interested in you know, sort of cognitive health, particularly for older adults and dementia. When I was um, in undergrad doing my bachelor's, um, I got to work with older adults in a memory care facility. And so I actually did a lot of hands-on care and working with them um, and just seeing the range 
uh, functioning, but also um, even though these are individuals who had memory problems, they they learned me. They were able to recognize me. They they figured out my name, all of that. Um, they knew I was a safe person, that I was there to provide care, and I, I just thought that that was really fascinating. That you know they were they were losing function in other ways, but they were able to to do some of the things that I think we commonly don't associate with individuals who may be suffering or individuals who are, are living with um, memory problems. So that, that was really interesting and it brought me to graduate school to do this kind of work. But then um, while I was in graduate school, I, I fell in love with statistics and methods and aging and changes in cognitive functioning are a, a great place to play around with statistics and, and do some of these different methods. So it kind of brings together two, two parts of my um, experiences and the things that I, that I enjoy working on. I feel very out of my depth because statistics is a very, very, very scary dark <laughs> cloud in the corner for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do I know? We begin each show with me having a stab at what I understand of this method. And today, for some reason, the multi-level part has got me fixated on the Nintendo games from the 90s. But let's have a go with multi-level modelling. So despite my earlier joke, I think perhaps this method is about connecting what might otherwise appear to be unrelated data sets or analysing data with a repeated measurement. So thinking of this in the context of dementia, this could be the time taken to complete cognition tests with different individuals or groups. It sounds complicated and something which could perhaps require some coding skills. Bill, how did I do? Perhaps you could give us a proper introduction to the method? Well, thank, thanks, Leah. Um, well, you, you had me thinking there of Pac-Man, which shows, <laughs> shows my age where you're collecting dots and those dots are nested in game levels. So everywhere is a multi-level model. Uh, but really, actually, it's best to start by thinking about data uh, and what makes that data in, in, in multi-level in, in, in context. So when you go and collect data uh, and you're going to analyze it, then many of the standard statistics that you might have been taught, uh, those techniques tend to under assume that the data you collect is some sort of random sample that you've collected from a big population. And then that, that data is, is kind of collected independently. So you can imagine uh, in the UK, the National Lottery, where there's the machine with the balls spinning round and those balls come out at random. But in practice, when we go out and collect data for real, uh, particularly if that data is observational in nature, then that independence idea tends to go out the window. For example, if you wanted to answer questions, I, I work in education these days, uh, and your questions were about, say, school education, then you'd have to go and do some data collection and construct a list of all the pupils in the UK, like the phone book, and then randomly choose pupils, travel hundreds of miles just to get one pupil from this school and one pupil from that school. And in practice, what we're more likely to do is to pick a selection of schools and then maximize the use of each of those schools by sampling a large number of pupils in each. And this will then result into a what we would call a hierarchical or multi-level data structure where you've got two levels you've got the pupils nested within schools now if you're in a more medical context and if you're thinking about dementia i guess we may have you know people people with dementia who are maybe nested in care homes for example and you have a similar two-level structure so having collected the data you've kind of broken the assumption of independence so we need to adjust our modeling and this is where the multi-level modeling rather than data comes in. So if you think again of the education context, if you've got pupils within schools, then on average, two pupils that, that come from the same school, they'll be much more alike in many ways than two randomly picked pupils from the whole population. They'll share lots of things in common. They'll have the same teachers. The school might have the same curriculum, the same ethos. Same catchment areas, all of these things might influence um, the outcomes for those, for those pupils. So the correlation needs to be accounted for. And multi-level level models in natural are effectively extensions to those standard statistical models that make some sort of correction to account for the underlying data structures. They can do other fun things. They can answer research questions about the structure, as well as, for example, how important the schools are how much correlation there is in the data. 
okay I think I get it <laughs> so it's it's sort of different like well I'm going to repeat what you've just said back but it's different levels of of data isn't it so you've got the sort of the I'm, I'm picturing a concentric circles for some reason one within the other I don't know yeah yeah and you could have more than two levels I mean you could have um you know, if, if we think of the dementia example, you could have the people who nested within care homes or maybe hospital settings and those in more larger um, medical areas, you know, uh, districts, for example. Um, and, and each of these levels, the, these structures actually actually influence the, the responses within them because, they, because there is this correlation built in because they're, they, they share things in, in some ways. Is this method as hard to use as it sounds? Because it sounds um, terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, multi-level modeling, actually, it's not so much hard for, for, for the person, it's actually harder for the computer. Okay. Because the mathematics that's involved in actually getting estimates out of these multi-level models and the model fitting is much more complicated. Uh, so if we go way back into the era of, of Pac-Man that we mentioned earlier, back in the 1980s and 90s, then you could only really fit these multi-level models in specialist statistical software. So teams of researchers in, uh, in statistics departments were developing those methodological techniques uh, and then developing uh, very old fashioned bits of software, which would take a long time to run to run those models. Uh, these days, you know, life has moved on, computers are faster, my mobile phone is, is way faster than any machine in the 1990s. Uh, so you can do some multi-level models in most statistical packages. Uh, the models are more complicated, so you do, uh, thinking from the person perspective, need a little bit more in effort in actually interpreting what comes out of these models. But, but generally, it isn't that much harder than, 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 than it sounds. Okay, so, so what are the benefits of multi-level modelling? Okay, well, that's a good question. Uh, I think maybe a better question is, you know, what are you losing if you don't do a multi-level modeling? So what are the disadvantages of not doing multi-level modeling? And, and historically, obviously, multi-level modeling hasn't been around forever. Uh, people would use simpler procedures and just pretend that they had independence. And when you do that, you don't account for the clustering. It's as if, it's as if you'd had them... Um, Got on, got on your bike and travel to every different school and just got one pupil from each school so there isn't any clustering uh, so if you assume there isn't clustering in your data you are overconfident in what you find and so you can find significant results that are not in practice really there okay uh, so you really haven't had properly adjusted for the data you've collected well what might be an appropriate place to use this method what when might you use it so I guess, I guess uh, the key point really is if your data has this nested structure, uh, any sort of dependency in your data requires you to, to use a statistical model that accounts for that dependency. Uh, and in practice, when, when, when I teach multi-level workshops uh, to, to people from lots of different disciplines, they find that actually the world is full of these hierarchies. Most observational data will have some structure built into it in the way that it's been recorded. And then multi-level modeling is really a must. So there has actually been something of a boom in articles that use multi-level modeling to the, to the degree that some journals will say, come back with referees reports saying you must use multi-level modeling here. Uh, and one caveat is usually you need reasonably large amount of data for multi-level modeling. So sometimes small studies, you don't need to do multi-level modeling and you have to tell the referees, no, I don't need multi-level modeling here. I haven't got that much data. That's fascinating. And I think I understand it. <laughs> so Jacqueline, thank you again so much for joining us. So, so you've actually used this method and I'm, I'm hoping that'll make a bit more sense to me. Can you, can you tell me a bit about that work and how it can really help in dementia research? Sure, so I have definitely used this method a bunch. Um, <laughs> my advisor was someone who pushed this um, in a big way when I was in graduate school. So I've had a lot of experience doing this in and around cognitive health research and specifically within dementia, largely because we aren't necessarily interested in comparing different groups of individuals who, you know, people living with dementia versus people who aren't. Um, that 
categorizes people in ways that doesn't tell us much about how they change over time. So Leah, you mentioned earlier repeated assessments and that's exactly the way to think, that's exactly the way that I think about it in dementia research is that, you know, we really want to follow an individual over time and see how they change. And in that case, just as Bill mentioned, this creates that dependency. So we have the same person who's coming back to the clinic and completing measures multiple times across years, there's a dependency there. All the data is being generated by the same individual. So we would expect there to be this, this correlation across observations. And that means that you want to account for that correlational structure. So when we do this in our projects, we like to look at you know, how cognition is changing over time. And we want to account for the fact that different people start with different levels of cognition. So they're gonna join our studies at different places in the trajectory of how their cognition is changing. And the multi-level model can accommodate that, um, you know, those differences across individuals so that each person can have their own starting point as opposed to making everyone kind of start in the same place. And that is, um, I think one of the, for, for me, because a lot of my models are longitudinally based MLM uh, multi-level models, they, you know, we're really talking about watching people change over time. And we don't want to constrain anyone to look like another person when they don't, so that we can tease apart, you know, why are people sort of starting in different places? Is it different educational attainment? Is it, you know, different lifestyle, you know, behaviors? We can see sort of that people start in different places. And to me, one of the biggest strengths of the, the modeling is that you can also allow people to have different change over time. So you can include um, one of the, the big things, and this is more of a technical term, um, but hopefully the audience can look it up if they're interested, is this idea of random slopes. So you can allow people to have different trajectories of change over time. And the random slopes, you can do the same sort of idea. So not only will people sort of start in different places, but they'll also change differently over time. And that could be because of lifestyle factors. That could be because of education. That could be because of other things that are happening for them. So we can understand sort of these models can capture a bit better how people start sort of differently in terms of their cognition, but then also whether their cognition is sort of declining slowly or declining quickly across time, and we can allow our models to accommodate all of those. Um, so some of the other techniques that have been used in the past, like repeated measures analysis of variance, constrain everyone to sort of change in the same way over time. And the multi-level model gives you this more flexibility so that you can look at, you know, these, these other types of trajectories in the data. Okay, okay. So what kind of data are you collecting when you're, when you're doing multi-level modeling? So that's, that's a really great question because it's like everything. We kind of throw the kitchen sink in a lot of our studies. So we have a tendency to um, collect these large data sets. So when we, when we get participants in our studies, we treat them as kind of a captive audience. And so we you know, get lots of assessments of cognition, we get, other things that we think might be going on. So we're really interested in this idea of lifestyle factors that might make cognitive change faster or slower for some folks. We're particularly interested in stress and thinking about, it may not be how old you are that makes sure cognition change faster. It might be how many stressors you've had. And so we're able to incorporate a lot of those measures in our annual assessments so that we can look at you know, things like lifestyle factor change and how that may precipitate cognitive change or looking at, you know, sort of the accumulation of stress over time and how that might lead to cognitive change. So the, the nice thing about the multi-level models is that we can look at things like where people enter the study, what their baseline levels of, uh, you know, different lifestyle factors or, you know, previous life history, like education, if, you know, they're not still going to school or something like that, we can, we can look at those factors, but we can also look at what's going on with this person right now. And is that related to how their cognition is doing? And so we can look at two different kinds of predictors, really things that change over time within a person 
that might change with their cognition, like stress or, um, you know, other things that are going on, like social interactions, um, physical activity. And we can see, you know, at times when someone is having more social interactions, is their cognition better? Or at times when they've had fewer social interactions, is their cognition worse? And that can start to unpack a little bit what's going on for a person, not just um, you know, sort of at baseline, but then also how they're changing across, across time. And is there any other sort of specific methods that you would use alongside multi-level modeling? So I tend to be a multi-level modeler. That's, that's, that's kind of my identity. Um, you can do other things like regressions, um, structural equation modeling. So a newer area of work is combining uh, structural equation modeling with multi-level modeling. So you can have these multi-level structural equation models, which are a really exciting and new direction that have a lot more power, they have a lot more data requirements and things like that, but they, you can do some really, really interesting work and answer some, some new questions with these more sophisticated types of models. So, you know, we run the gambit with all of the, you know, different types of models, although I would say multi-level models are, are bread and butter over here. And, and are there any sort of special considerations um, for using this method in relation to dementia or neurodegenerative um, diseases? So I would say the one of the biggest benefits, but also one of the drawbacks to a, a lot of statistical, statistical analyses when you're looking at longitudinal data is loss to follow up. So, you know, particularly when we're thinking about um, dementia or other other types of health conditions more generally, you know, the, the folks who are sicker are more likely to not come back for follow-up. Um, they have a lot more going on, and obviously, and so they're going to, um, you know, they're going to drop out sooner, and, you know, they, they could potentially die or have other problems where they can't access the assessment. So, you know, that that's obviously a, a big weakness to any analysis. I will say on the plus side, again, the push for multi-level modeling is that multi-level modeling can incorporate people who have different amounts of data. So, you know, even if an individual does drop out of the study or is lost to follow up at some point, you can still incorporate their earlier data in the model so that you can actually um, make your estimates more robust. So, you know, you're not, in a place where you know the sickest people end up getting dropped out of the model because they couldn't complete all of the eight assessments or five assessments, whatever your follow up is, and that's that's really important for understanding um, you know how how these different groups of individuals might be changing over time. The you know other consideration and one that I think um, just very gently, I think we could do better at is the sensitivity of measures to change. So in our studies of cognition, we, we can rely on measures that maybe don't pick up on change over time as, as well as they could. And so in, in those cases, you know, your multi-level model, any variable that you want to analyze with the multi-level model needs to have variability across time. And if you're using a measure that is, you know, uh, doesn't have a ton of variability or doesn't pick up on change very well, then your multi-level model might not work, but it's not because people aren't changing. It's because your measure is not sensitive enough to pick it up. And I think that, you know, that, that is an area that we, um, again, very gently could do better do better with in um, sort of the cognitive health space. That was very gentle. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds like um, that it can be a lot more inclusive than multi-level modeling in, in sort of allowing for, for everything that happens just as part of life during research. Yeah, and you wanna be planful about that. Um, again, we focus on stress, so we tend to collect samples and think about our samples focusing on stress as you know, one of the big predictors of this. In other studies, when we're thinking about other lifestyle factors and we want to include more covariates and more um, of these variables that change over time, then you, you need more people, you need more observations per person. So these studies are incredibly intensive. Um, and so you, you do have to think about what, what process 
is going on, or at least you think is sort of theorized so that you can focus your, your measurement, focus your um, resources on, on those aspects of, of aging or lifestyle or whatever it is you're interested in. Thank you. So now we have a description of what the method is and an example of how it's been used. Let's talk guidance and help anyone who thinks this method could be useful for them. In this segment, I'm going to ask some quick, straightforward questions to both guests on how to put this method into practice. Bill, you're the lucky one. You get to go first. How should someone prepare to use this method? I assume a good head for maths is important. Thanks for that. Um... I mean, it was interesting listening to Jacqueline, the, the, the longitudinal data is one, one obviously um, aspect where multi-level modeling comes in. And I think really the first thing one has to check is that your data really requires the multi-level modeling. As sometimes what happens, people hear about multi-level modeling and assume they have to use it always and every time. And uh, if you think of the longitudinal modeling, I mean, you may, you may have be, be studying a specific um, subset of dementia sufferers, and, and uh, which is quite rare. So you've got lots of data on three or four uh, individuals. Then it'd be quite hard to do multi-level modeling because you haven't really got enough data for, for that. So as long as you've got enough data, then multi-level modeling uh, isn't a problem. And it isn't really necessary to know that much mathematics. Uh, I mean, the computer software should be doing the hard work for you. Uh, the challenge comes, uh, in a way, in actually interpreting uh, what the computer spits out at you, you know, in terms of the results. So in terms of actual preparation, it really is quite useful to revise your, your more uh, standard statistics. Uh, having some knowledge of regression modeling is useful. Uh, once you've got some data, attending a training course is often a good idea. Uh, and at our research center, we, we actually also produce online training resources. We've got one called, called Lemma, and that's been used by, because it's free, it's been used by thousands of people and is felt to be useful. So there are loads and loads of resources around the world. There are lots of sites that give, give lots of materials. And I think doing a bit of, bit of homework before you start is always good. Thank you. And, and what software would you recommend for multi-level modeling? Is Because I've, I've heard so much about SPSS, is that one of them? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I've, I've just just finished teaching with SPSS uh, the, the, this morning, so that's a that's kind of a tricky one for me because we we develop software specifically for doing multi level modeling. So it'd be it'd be rude of me to say, oh, you should use our software. Um, we, we we develop something called ML Win, which kind kind of just does uh, multi-level modeling. Uh, but, but generally the more standard statistics, statistical software packages like R and Stata have got very good multi-level modeling functionality. And if you already use those packages for your other statistical work, then you're probably best sticking with what you know. Uh, and in fact, we, we, we've written little packages that, that, that within those packages so that you can use our, our software within each of those packages as well. Um, the course that the Lemma course that we produce has got training material on different software packages. So, so my, my suggestion always is use something you're familiar with. Uh, the dreaded SPSS, well, SPSS we use for, 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 for more basic stats, I think mainly because universities have got licenses of it across the piece. It has got some multi-level functionality even SPSS, but it is rather limited. So, 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 uh, if you if you are familiar with SPSS, you could go there. But I would probably suggest one of the other packages personally. And what considerations should you give when considering the results? So, from a multi-level modeling you, uh, model, you'll often get sort of coefficients for different different terms in the model and standard errors saying how accurate those coefficients are, just like in a regression model. So you can use those to check for significant relationships. Uh, and as with all statistical modeling, the models make lots of assumptions and people, um, lots of these packages are point and click type packages. So people just point and click and not really realize there's lots of assumptions going on in the background. So it can be, can be useful to test those assumptions. So you can plot what we call residuals, how well the model fits in a way and check if you've got any unusual observations and that they follow the, the required distributions that are underlying the, the model that you're fitting. So I've had lots of um, mentions of regression models, and I have to ask, how do multi-level models differ from regression models? Um, so, so I guess most people, many people were familiar with a regression model. I mean, it's like fitting a straight line through a set of 
points it would be the easiest way to describe it. And really, multilevel models are just a, an extension of those regression models. Uh, so one thing that we, we generally would suggest is, is that when you're fitting a multilevel model, you can test whether you need it by comparing it with a regression model, which, which doesn't account for the clustering in your data. Uh, and, and if it's no better in terms of its fit, then you might just use a regression model. So that's one thing that they can be seen as like multi-level models can be seen as an extension of regression models, but they can answer other questions. Like they can identify really the importance of different clustering. Uh, if you find some relationship, uh, it, it, and you could say, well, does that vary from hospital to hospital, from care home to care home? How important is the context that the data is in? Um, so, it, so it can be useful to do that and looking to see if the relationships vary across the different clusters. Maybe in, in an education example, we might find that there's a gender gap, for example, in exam results. Does that gap vary from school to school? In some gaps, maybe, maybe unusually boys do better than girls. In most places, girls tend to do better than boys, unfortunately, for, for, for me, but there we are. Um, I, I, I think, I think there, there are lots of examples where, where, where you, could, you could use a multi-level model to answer research questions. Brilliant, thank you. And Jacqueline, it's your turn. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. So you kindly told us about your research earlier and, and how much work did you have to do on the data in advance? I would say on some level, no more than you would do for any statistical analysis. It, it feels like more, usually because you have more data. So you usually have you know, longitudinal assessments and that means more data per person and again, because we do throw the kitchen sink at our participants, you know, there's lots of variables that you could be working with. There are some additional steps like looking at loss to follow up, looking at, you know, where is your missing data? Are there any patterns there that you should be accounting for so that, you know, you aren't biasing the analyses in any way by excluding people like maybe you had a particularly difficult cognitive test and very few people were able to finish it. Then that might not be your best outcome measure and you'll want to be screening for that um, so that you're not using only the people who could you know potentially complete a particular test or something like that. The you know going back to your question about packages, Leah, I would say that depend one of the problems problems with multi-level modeling is that different packages use different structures. So there can be some restructuring issues depending on which statistical software you decide to use. So I would look for other examples of people doing it in the software that you're deciding to use. I'm a SAS user. SAS uses a slightly different setup than other packages. And there are a lot of um, packages like bills out there that are you know, specialized and do multi-level modeling really well. But again, you need to know the structure so that you're setting up the data in the way that you want so that you're not getting lots of errors that you don't understand. And it's simply because the data is not quite structured right. Um, the other, I think, sort of initial step in the data is always looking at that variability question. You know, like Bill was saying that, you know, if you don't have variability in your outcomes, if you don't have variability in your mes measures, do you need multi-level modeling? I would argue in longitudinal data, you will almost always have that correlation. So you almost always need to do some sort of multi-level modeling, but you still might not have enough variability going back to the measure sensitivity issue earlier. So doing some initial steps to make sure that there's variability there, that you're able to sort of detect it, that it's not, you know, sort of tiny um, and being able to, to make sure that the, the models are gonna eventually converge so that you can get an answer to your question. And if someone is mining data or using an existing data set to perform research, are there any particular considerations for that? I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record. Sensitivity of measures. <laughs> uh, I think that that is, is a big one, is making sure that your, you know, your secondary data set has measures that are going to pick up on change uh, and that you think are going to sort of perform well in this context. The other ones that I would think about are, you know, how, how much follow-up is there and how closely spaced are your follow-ups? So sometimes we'll refer to this as the granularity of follow-up. So how, you know, are people followed every year, every two years? Different studies will have different spacing and that can lead to different issues. For example, one of the data sets that I work on has a 10-year interval in between observations. 
So we have this, this really great aging perspective because we can follow people over, now we have um, two decades of data, but we only have three observations really. So even though we have a lot of information about aging per se, we don't have this really closely timed data that you might have in you know, something like um, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging where they follow people every year or so. So you know, things like that I think are, are really important. The other, um, the other thing that I again wanna say again gently is the age of the data set. And by age, I don't mean the age of the participants. I mean, like how long ago was it collected? The, you know, there are a lot of longitudinal data sets out there that started a really long time ago and are still being mined, which I think is fabulous and is a tribute to the participants who you know, put in that time and energy to give us that data. But we also do know that there are cohort effects. And so we want to think about these different longitudinal trajectories and how people's cognition is changing, I think in the context of when the data were actually collected. So I think that those are, those are um, my, my caveats for secondary data analysis. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, data and access to massive data sets has become huge in dementia research as we consider different risk factors and how they contrast and compare in different populations. And with some really great platforms like Dementia Platforms UK, they have high birth and dementia specific cohorts with long histories of cognition test scores that could be looked at. Or I can even see how things like a supermarket loyalty card as shopping data could be perhaps overlaid to look at something like purchases over time, maybe, to see if that's a result of um, a treating condition. Although I must admit, with my loyalty card at Sainsbury's, they always just send me vouchers for their cheese twists and it gets a bit much. <laughs> So what have we learned so far? We have learned that multi-level modeling is something I find very confusing. <laughs> we have thought about the sort of the different um, and different variables that are accounted for and the ways in which it can help us really be quite inclusive with research and, and make um, or draw conclusions based on context. Um, what's happening around the participants at that time and I can see Jacqueline nodding so I'm hoping that makes sense. In this final part of the show we're going to discuss the common pitfalls, challenges and how to avoid them. I get the feeling this is going to be one of those methods that someone could grasp really quickly and once you have a handle on it it's easy to use or if you're like me and you're more qualitative it's completely hard to fathom and it's just sort of sat in the corner and I don't want to go near it very much. <laughs> Jacqueline, can you tell us what you um, what you did come across in your in delivering your research and and what you might you do differently if 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 you could? Uh, so I do a lot of secondary data. So I want to be clear that like I love the available data sets that are out there. It's it's really amazing to have access to that because we do want to follow people over time, and that means that we have to wait if we're starting a new study and that can take a very long time if we want to watch people and watch their cognition change. I think, you know, one of the challenges I have now, though, is that there are different types of contexts that I'm interested in that I kind of wish I had longitudinal data on that we don't have. And I think we're getting a bigger perspective and a broader perspective on the types of lifestyle factors, the types of contextual factors, like you said, Leah, that we want to know more about and that might be impacting cognitive health. And some of the older studies don't have that. And so even though those are factors that we think are really important, we, you know, we don't have comprehensive data longitudinally on that yet. I mean, we're getting there. We, there are absolutely studies in the field doing this, but I, I do wish that I had not been so afraid of primary data collection <laughs> earlier on so that we could actually um, have some of that data and have, have our cohort sort of in the field and collecting that data. Cause it's, it, we are just learning so much from these data sets that I, I wish we could, you know, sort of jump in there and get, get some more data on some of these things. Well, we always love opportunities for further research. So <laughs> here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bill, so you teach this method. What would you say are the common pitfalls? What would you warn your students about? 
Uh, I think I think Leah, just like all statistical modeling, you know, one of the pitfalls is that people try to get as much information as they can from their data, and sometimes they're trying to get information that isn't really there. They haven't collected enough data. They've got a really difficult problem that it's difficult to collect lots of data in. So, for example, in education, it may be true there's an impact of clustering of pupils within schools, and schools are important maybe on exam results. But if your data set only has free schools, it's going to be really hard to sort of pull apart school effects from that data. You really need more data to answer that. Um, and then to generalize those findings to, 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 to all pupils, not just in the free schools that you've collected data on. And I think sometimes uh, people struggle struggle with that. They also struggle with, with working out what, what, what is a level in a multi-level model, for example, like, like the schools we're talking about here. Whereas if you've got a categorical predictor, like say gender or ethnicity, people think, well, isn't that a level? And not really, you know, gender and ethnicity is, it's categorical, but it doesn't have, it's got a very much pre-described set of categories and it's not like a collection that you're, you're, you're sampling from. So those are things that people sometimes struggle to grasp. I mean, I think this method could really benefit for some, from some graphic examples, but to both of you, is, is there any advice you would like to share that hasn't already been covered? I'll nominate Bill first. Okay, okay. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I'm using the word graphic, perhaps in a different context here, but, but when you're doing statistics, figures and, and plots are always important. Um, when you look at data, and certainly in multi-level modeling, it's no different. We really might advise people to plot their data and look at patterns that exist before they turn the handle and fit the, the computer, uh, the model in the computer package. And certainly in more complex models, plots of what the model is actually showing can explain to the researcher what's going on whether they do graphs, and uh, I think Jacqueline mentioned this earlier, random slopes versus random intercept models. They, a random intercept model will have lots of parallel lines showing you the, 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 um, the relationship for the different clusters, whereas a random slopes model will show you different relationships going on with each cluster. Um, and there's also the, the, the infamous caterpillar plots that we use in multi-level modeling, which uh, if you squint your eyes enough may resemble the, the, the caterpillar. Uh, they can show differences between clusters. So, so I think, I, I'm not sure if that was what you meant by graphic examples, but I think figures are important. I'll let Kat, Jacqueline answer it probably properly. I'm just thinking of the hungry, hungry caterpillar now, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess the advice that I would give is like, don't be afraid of it. Uh, you know, this is a really sophisticated statistical tool, but but there are people like us out here who are happy to share our knowledge and, and think the world of these types of models and think that they are really, really important for us to be using to, to truly understand what's going on with folks. Um, some of the other types of data that I collect are actually ecological momentary assessment data where we have individuals complete multiple, multiple surveys per day for multiple days. And then we do that again in like a year. So we actually get this really intense longitudinal data on folks. And that has you know, three or four levels depending on how you want to think about that data. That can be really intimidating and I would just say that we're, you know, like I said, there, there are lots of experts out here who are, you know, willing and eager to, to see this type of work going on and who are, you know, um, just really big proponents of these models and can point you to resources, can point you to other experts. And, you know, we, we want people using these models. We think they're, we think they're the, the best. And so we really, we really want to get them out there. And they're um, not, not as scary as they first appear. I find them terrifying. <laughs> but I must admit, after talking to you both, they don't seem as scary. It, does, it seems like something I could wrap my head around. <laughs> I can see how it's a, a great method to have in your toolkit as well. I mean, it, it, even if this isn't the primary method you might you might use, having the knowledge and the skills available to use it presents all kinds of new opportunities, particularly when you factor in the massive amounts of data now available to dementia researchers. Right, so it's time for our final segment. I'm going to give our expert Bill one minute, exactly one minute, <laughs> to tell our listeners what they should go away and read to further their knowledge on this method. 
Bill, over to you. I'm starting the clock now. Pressure's on. Um, <laughs> it would be remiss, I guess, of me, given given uh, the NCRM or a part of this broadcast, not to, to plug their own website because they have lots and lots of training resources, including stuff on multi-level modeling. Uh, lots of videos there as well. Uh, our lemma course I plugged earlier, and certainly we've got lots of other resources on the Center for Multi-Level Modeling work website. Uh, in terms of books, there are lots of good ones. Uh, in the Netherlands, there are lots of Dutch academics. They're, they're more quantitative in their social science tradition. So there are books by people like Tom Snyders and Raoul Boska, and also by Joop Hox and some of his co-authors. They're, they're, they're good introductions, I would say. Uh, our former colleague, Harvey Goldstein, he's got a, a very cited book, but I would say it's a, it's a bit mathematical for the beginner. So 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 that will, if you want scary equations, there's lots in Harvey's book. And there are also lots of handbooks out there that focus on particular application areas and particular software packages. So it's good to look around. These days, there's loads of stuff on the web as well. I'm sure if you Google multi-level model, you'll come up with lots of resources. So I can't vouch for every one of them. Well, thank you so much. It's time for a trip to the library or I'll probably just YouTube it and watch a video. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. So let me say a huge thank you to our brilliant guests who have both opened my eyes to the potential of multi-level modelling. From Penn State, we have the inspirational Dr Jacqueline Mogul and of course our very expert expert from the University of Bristol, Professor Bill Brown. Thank you both so much for coming. So join me again tomorrow for our fifth and final show in the series, which is perfect because I really, really need to do some writing and I can procrastinate no longer. Uh, tomorrow we'll be discussing a method I have used in my own work, qualitative secondary analysis. If you've only just found our podcast or are catching up the series, remember all this week the NCRM Methods Festival is taking place and there is still time to take a look. So head over to ncrm.ac.uk for more information, where you will find many of the sessions available on catch up. Finally, of course, I'd also love to encourage you to visit the Dementia Researcher website for all things dementia and research, from careers support, research discussion, events, jobs, funding calls and so much more. Thank you all for listening.